Hello everyone, I um, hope that you can all see and hear me all right. Welcome to our talk all about the rich archaeology of the Pembrokeshire coast. So you can see I'm joined by some guests tonight. I'll just introduce us um, and do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So if you don't know me, my name is Ginny and I'm a community archaeologist with Dig Ventures. If you've attended one of our live events before or joined us in person for a dig, you'll probably have met me. Um, but when I'm not in the field, it's my job to run our online events just like this one tonight. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague Kim tonight. Kim's been in the chat and she'll be here in the background just to help me look after all of you and to make sure that everything's running smoothly. If you're new to Dig Ventures, we're a team of archaeologists who are on a mission to connect people who love archaeology with opportunities to do it for themselves, either online or in the field. One such opportunity is quite relevant tonight, which is our crowdfunded dig at Carvai Promontory. Uh, I won't give too much away yet, though, about that dig. Uh, I'll leave that to our speakers later. But I will say it's a really incredible place, and it's one of the sites we're going to be talking about tonight. And it's also my background behind me, so it's almost like I'm there. And of course, working with us to run that very dig is the amazing team at the Cherish Project, including our two wonderful speakers tonight. I'll let them tell you a bit more about who Cherish are and the incredible work that they do later. But for now, I'd like to introduce Toby Driver and okay. Louise Barker. Toby is an aerial archaeologist and prehistorian, working as a senior investigator at the Royal Commission, as well as being part of the Cherish team. Louise is also an archaeologist specialising in landscape survey and interpretation, working with the Royal Commission in Wales and the Cherish Project. But I don't want, like I said, I don't want to give too much away. It's almost it from me. Um, but before I pass over to our speakers, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping for you all, just to make sure we all know where we are. So here we go. Coastal Wonders, Ancient Monuments of the Pembrokeshire Coast. House rules tonight, do remember to keep it friendly. You've all been really lovely in the chat so far. It's been great to hear from you. Um, use the Q&A feature to submit any questions throughout the talk. If you sort of wiggle your mouse, you'll be able to see that at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer. Do also feel free to use the chat to comment and respond. We'd like to keep it sort of conversational tonight. So if any of you do have anything that you'd like us to discuss as we go through our talk, please do share it in there. Um, if you find the chat distracting, however, feel free to close that panel and turn off the notifications. That's absolutely fine if you'd rather just listen. Um, and do be patient. Um, this is technology and sometimes technology can go a little bit wrong. Um, so bear with us while we fix that. Um, and as for the content warning, I think that was left in from our last talk. As far as I'm aware, there's not going to be any human remains. But if there is, at least you've been warned. <laughs> but there shouldn't be as far as I know. So coming up tonight, we're going to do a quick introduction um, and then we're going to hear all from our special guests about Coastal Wonders. Um, we're also going to do a Q&A at the end and I'll tell you a little bit about how you can get involved as well. And then last from me too, just in case any of you in the chat aren't from the UK or if you're not familiar with Pembrokeshire or the Pembrokeshire coast, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a geography lesson just to get you up to speed. So as you can see, Pembrokeshire is in South Wales. You can see it there on the bottom left, quite literally on the bottom left in the bottom left. <laughs> um, and it's got this beautiful, rugged coastline. Um, but unfortunately, you can probably notice in those pictures that it has been affected quite a lot by coastal erosion and climate change as well. So all of that's gonna come into play tonight. Um, in our talk, and we're going to hear a little bit more about how archaeologists deal with that um, and what sorts of things we can do to mitigate the challenges um, that are coming from that. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I'll just sort of go through our format. So like I said, we're very, very grateful to be joined by Louise and Toby today, who are here to share their wealth of knowledge about Pembrokeshire's promontory forts. We've prepared sort of a series of questions to help guide our discussion tonight, which I'm going to be posing to our speakers. And as I mentioned, we'd like to keep this somewhat informal, somewhat conversational. So if you do have any questions or comments or responses throughout the talk tonight, please feel free to just drop them in the chat as we go. 
or if you'd rather wait to the end you can use the Q&A feature and we'll come back to you. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add our speakers as a spotlight so you should be able to see them now too um, and I'm going to start with a nice easy question for you guys. If you could just introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little bit about how you came to be involved with archaeology and with the Cherish project. Thanks. Uh, I'm Toby Driver. I'm uh, Louise Barker. And uh, well, we've been in archaeology quite a long time, I guess, haven't we, Lou? Uh, I did archaeology at university in Southampton years ago. I uh, had a gap year beforehand looking at stone circles in Karnak and Brittany and, and, and Newgrange as well. Um, worked for commercial units for a couple of years, which is really good grounding, I think, for anybody. And then uh, joined the Royal Commission, uh, where I've been ever since. And uh, same by me, I uh, studied all those years ago, probably 26, 28 years ago now, studied archaeology. I love being outdoors. I love history. I love geography. And that seemed a really good way to move into sort of what I loved most. And that was being outdoors and studying that kind of thing. And um, I've been in Wales now, joined the, the, the commission nearly 18 years ago. And so I've um, been working with Toby for those 18 years. And um Pembrokeshire has always been a place that that you know the archaeology there is absolutely wonderful and there's some some good stuff and it's been a, a, a draw and in terms of the Cherish project we um we devised that with some colleagues nearly eight years ago now and was successful in getting all that funding and so it's enabled us to to explore more of the the coastal and um, maritime zone of Wales and Ireland really so something we'd wanted to 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 do and seen as really important for 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 many years. Fantastic year, and I think you've done a great job. We've learned so much that we didn't really know before, um, including about promontory forts, which is sort of the focus of our talk tonight. Um, so as a bit of a starter for anyone who hasn't been to our dig in Carvai or doesn't know themselves, could you maybe take us through uh, what a coastal promontory fort is? Well, yeah, shall I share our screen now? We've got a little presentation here, but we can go through it uh, and... Um... And, and tackle some of these questions and so on as well as they come up. I'm just going to uh, to pop that up. Uh, and are you seeing uh, our presentation now? Yeah, that looks great. Excellent. That's us out on the, the coast path uh, last summer uh, with our colleagues, uh, Hannah and Jane, who also help us with the survey on the Cherish project as well. Um, but yeah, should we get to the uh, the next slide? Uh, over to you, Lou. Yeah, so talking about coastal promontory thoughts, well, I think the first thing to say is that majority of them are really obvious features um, on the coastline. So bearing that in mind, they're, they're a monument type that's been studied for, for many centuries, really. And one of the things I love to do when I, I um, am looking at a site or looking at a group of monuments is to sort of go back as far as I can to sort of get the understanding of the thought and the process of what people were thinking about these sites and where they've been and um, I always came across this this image of the secret of the cliff castle and the cliff castle is also another name for a, a promontory fort and it's um, often named as such in Cornwall so the Cornwall promontory forts and so in terms of Pembrokeshire I think it's in the sort of 19th century where there was more thought that's when the thought and the debate started about what what these sites were and um that's when you get these really, uh, there's a few quotes on the screen now, you get these absolutely sort of wonderful of their time descriptions and theories. So the theories always were for, for many years that they were perhaps what we would term early medieval now, um, associated with um, Danish and Viking raiders, really. And they were always seen as possibly being the fact that the promontories were were seen as the invaders. That's where they had their strongholds on the coastline, and that the natives of the area were 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 living inland at that point. But also, we see other ideas, sort of from laws there in eighteen eighty, which had an idea that possibly they might be prehistoric in date, so that they they were strongholds on the coastline, and rather being seen as sort of settlements, these were sort of. Um, refuges in times of warfare so people would re retreat to the coast in 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 times of war and um as you can see it could be readily defended even by a few women could defend <laughs> these sites back then in the the 1880s so that sort of laid the foundation of 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 early thoughts of what these were and it spans everything from prehistory some thousands of years ago right the way through to 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 hundreds of years ago but if we roll forward now taking that all in this is our latest, latest thoughts, really. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, Coastal Park, you've really introduced the subject really well there. I mean, it wasn't even, it's Sabine Baring Gold, uh, uh, Reverend Sabine Baring Gold, who came up from Dartmoor to dig in, in Pembrokeshire in 1899. Uh, he wrote on Christian Soldiers, that famous uh, hymn as well. He was a great antiquarian, and it was only his work that began to nail down that these things are Iron Age and Roman period. Um, and the way we talk about coastal promontory forts is they're definitely wave washed. They're sticking out in the ocean. Um, they could date from the late Bronze Age through to the Iron Age uh, or even through to the post-Roman period as well. We'll look at that in a second. Um, but there are over 100 in Wales as, as total. Uh, so that's an awful lot of monuments. But most of those are in the Pembrokeshire coast. Uh, it's really very crowded in Pembrokeshire with these incredible coastal promontory forts. Just saw a little video there of, uh, of the promontory fort down at Flimston Bay. But you can see this map of Wales here of, of hill forts and Iron Age enclosures. Look at that density around uh, the Pembrokeshire coast down there. All these sites crowded on all the pro coastal promontories. Um, we also have, I think we have coastal forts as well. We have forts that aren't actually wave washed, but they're just inland. So Munnoth Carningley in Pembrokeshire, uh, Pendinus up the coast at Aberystwyth, Cara Tour at Holyhead. So they sit back from the coast, but they're overlooking those trade routes, the, the, the seaways. And I think we also have to think those had a strong role in, in coastal trade as well. I think, and if we place these, so we've got whales, but let's place them in the sort of wider context of the wi the wider world. Then it's it's a very much a monument type that you see down this like Atlantic band. So if we start off in Spain, you'll see the sort of promontory forts in Spain. You can see them around the the coast of Brittany in France, Cornwall. Most of the stuff is um, promontory forts there. All around Wales, you'll see them around Ireland, Isle of Man, around Scotland not so many in England around the, the East Coast and, and areas like that. So they're of a, a monument type that's clustered along the seaways in this sort of Atlantic zone, I suppose you could call mm, it. Yeah. Like that. I mean, it, it's it's easy for us to sort of um, keep talking about Iron Age and Bronze Age and Roman and things. Uh, but I think it's useful just to nail down that chronology, if that will help uh, there, Ginny. Uh, it's... Um, when we talk about later Bronze Age in Wales, we're going back 3,000 years. So we, we have occupation on some of these hilltops, these coastal promontory forts, 1200 to 800 BC. That's 3000 years ago, but this is an incredible time. These people in Wales had incredible bronze shields, swords, weaponry. It's an incredible economic sort of system going on as well. And we had a slump then with the, the climatic deterioration in the early Iron Age. Uh, but then we're into the Iron Age where things start really hotting up. We have early and middle Iron Age, 800 through to 50 BC a lot of activity on the coastal promontory forts around Pembrokeshire. And then this late Iron Age, 50 BC, trading with overseas, trading with the Greeks and Romans, and then and then the Romans invade. Uh, Caesar tries just before uh, the, the birth of Christ, about 50 BC, but then AD 43, Roman invasion of, of Britain, Britannia as it was. But this is where Wales differs from the rest of uh, the British Isles. Uh, AD 47 through to AD 80, we have this 30-year hiatus the Roman campaigning period in Wales, where the Romans were trying to win Wales and they invaded Anglesey twice, uh, but they couldn't quite sort out the west of Britain. So a really interesting period. Uh, and then we're into Roman Britain to AD 410, uh, and then Roman rule stops. And on the right here, we have a photograph of, um, well, here's our happy chappy from the Iron Age, blowing a carnix, an Iron Age war trumpet, uh, Cassie Hentley's, uh, and then unfortunately the professional legionaries of the Roman army uh, came in and absolutely slaughtered quite a lot of people in South Wales before they reached a sort of a negotiated peace. Fascinating, yeah, I think that's a really good sort of basis for us going forward. It's really interesting just to see how many of these forts are sort of scattered, not just in Pembrokeshire, but throughout Wales as well. Uh, there's a really high concentration there. Um, and we did, we actually, David had a question in the chat, which I thought we could address before we go forward. He mm. said that the opening sequence you had shows the cauldron at Flimston. And he wondered what came first, was it the fort or the cauldron itself? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about the cauldron yeah, very, soon, actually. Very yeah. good question. And it's one that we've, we've pondered um, for a while. Um, our understanding is that the cauldron came first and that's the way we'd like to see it, but we can talk a bit about that. Um, a bit later, if, if David's happy to wait until that point. No, there, it it yeah. will come across some of these uh, as well, yeah. There, there's a lot of erosion going on around the Pembrokeshire coast, a lot of bits of promontory fort falling off. We see this at Kaiavai and Lou, we'll talk about it later on as well. 
But there's some very, very old bits of the Pembrokeshire coast as well, which have stayed that way for de- centuries or, or, or millennia, really, uh, with only sudden changes every few centuries. Uh, and I think the cauldron has probably been there an awfully long time. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a quandary. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, David said he's happy to wait, so we can move on. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Um, so as you can see, our next topic, we've talked about where these forts are and what they are, but who sort of built these sites and were these uh, sort of settlement places or were they something else? Yeah, so um, we spoke about the, what the, the the sort of thoughts were and the, the, the documentary evidence, but let's, let's look at the sort of excavation evidence and... Um, and are these high status dwellings? A lot of the excavation evidence shows that people were, were living here. There's evidence of hut sites. There's evidence of the material culture that, that are all there. Now, were they high status settlements? Look at this wonderful um, uh, portable antiquity scheme find here on the right, which is the on a, a sword, a scabbard of a sword, which shows the sort of a very noble Iron Age face there. But it, it's not your barbarian. It's a clean shaven person. It's somebody of stature. So I think we need to, to, to sort of firstly think about the kind of society at that time and and where people were living and um rolling back um we don't have a huge amount of excavation evidence partly because um not many have been excavated so um within Pembrokeshire we've got sort of excavation evidence for for seven sites that have been excavated we find in the records that you know there's the odd scrapings there's the odd antiquarian um, muting of evidence but we don't have too much so when I say excavation I'm about talking about the ones that have been reported and uh, are written written up in journals and um, Toby mentioned the great excavation on um, St David's Head in 1899 which looked at some of the six um, roundhouses the six settlement huts that you can see there in St David's if you're in Pembrokeshire for me that would be your, your one site to walk out to to, to have, have a look at and in that excavation of those huts, they recognised there was flooring in there, there was halves, but they also found um, finds. And that's another quite rarity, as you'll know from the, the dig at, at Carby. We do get finds, but, you know, it's quite hard games to get some of those because of the soil deterioration to get the bones and the and, and the pottery. But but here we, we there was pottery. They had blue glass beads, spindle worlds, stone artefacts. And they were very much consistent, though, with the sort of Romano-British dates, so sort of first to the four centuries and then if we look onto the right hand side of that that image which probably shows why we want to be studying promontory forts because this is all that's left of this um black point wrath near broadhaven you can't get onto this site anymore it's just too dangerous but luckily nash williams um conducted excavation there in 1929 and looked at two of the hut circles again so two of the settlement sites that were located there and he did found some very badly um badly preserved pottery it was turned but also bones and shellfish and spindle walls we always get this the spindle walls at, at these sites and that seemed to be more pre prehistoric um in date those kind of finds and just quickly one other site that was was excavated which was in in 1970 by um Wainwright which is which is um Tower Point Promontory and actually again um this was as a precursor to erosion that was already happening at this site back then. So back in the 70s and earlier, these sites were recognised as being really vulnerable and we needed more research on it. Not many finds were found here at all. Um, but what was interesting, he did um, do an excavation across the defences and that's where we see the first idea that actually we've got evidence of phasing here. These weren't sites that were just occupied for for a hundred years or or less. There's evidence of occupation that could span 500, 600, 700 years. Whether that's continual um, occupation, we don't know that. But there, there's evidence that these sites were built, changed, altered as people were living in them. So the defences were altered. So we've got different different phases um, in in the defences there. But moving directly on, we're really lucky, certainly with the work that that you guys have been doing at Carvai and at the neighbouring um, promontory fort to to Carvai, um, which which is which is here at Porthoral, and um, this has had two real big phases of excavation. This was Cadu funded, which is um, Wales's Welsh government organisation, and also um, Cadu funded David Archaeological Trust to undertake this again as a community um, style excavation in the nineties. And you, they were excavating the narrow promontory. And here we've got extensive 
evidence of eight round houses starting in this sort of early to middle iron age moving to more stone structures in the in the roman period and then they did some stuff on the gateways as well didn't they yeah i mean this has been excavated by the david archaeological trust the last couple of years again they revisited and you can see lower left that's the excavation of the the, the gateway passage into um port Thorau, which we've not touched upon at clairvai yet big job to excavate gateways at these promontory forts this is incredible. This is an enormous promontory fort, but the gateway narrows to a point where it's about 1.5 metres wide between the gateposts. It's about as wide as your French doors getting into this promontory fort. So you get all these defences, all this pomp and ceremony, these four to five metre high ramparts. Uh, but you won't be able to get a chariot or a wagon in through the front door. It's just going to be people coming in on foot. So incredible results from here. Mm. Another site you can visit, actually, they've, they've, the David Trust has, has, and the National Trust have preserved that roundhouse on the right. Uh, you can see that with the slate half on site now. So you can actually go and visit that on, on site. It's brilliant. And, and how could we talk about promontory forts and not mention Kaivai, where uh, Dig Ventures has been blistering the way for the last couple of years. Um, Dig Ventures worked with Cherish uh, back in 2021 and then took forward their own excavation here last year. Some of you listening uh, may have uh, been digging there as well. Um, we chose to work on uh, Kaivai uh, with uh, Dig Ventures in the Cherish project because of the severe erosion that was happening on the isthmus inside the fort. Lots of evidence is being lost and had never been excavated, had it? Um, and uh, this is the neighbouring fort to Portharao. And just two fairly limited programs of excavation over the last couple of years have really uh, you know, shown us some incredible stuff. You can see up there, upper left, this is last summer, these two roundhouses appearing, and these are full of workshop debris, uh, metal working, particularly mm. interesting. Very interesting. And you can see that crucible base being held up there. So iron working, but also copper working. Well, copper is found in Pembrokeshire, so are they working the local copper? Some of you may recognize that circle stone ring being held up. That's a spindle whirl. So that's what you use to weigh down a strand of wool and draw it out to make thread to, to knit with or to, to, uh, to weave with. Uh, and these are found all over Iron Age sites. So what we're looking at really, I suppose, hopefully what we've just described is these are, are settlement sites. So first and foremost, people were living and working working here. And that is what all of the excavation evidence that, that that we've seen on the limited of seven excavations that we've had around Pembrokeshire, but it's all it that's how it, it fits in really. But nothing straightforward. Portharao, Roman pottery, mm. Roman glass beads, Roman occupation. So a, a negotiated peace with the invaders, uh, and the and the locals continued to live there with Roman pottery to the fourth century AD. Carvai, I think I'm right in saying, still no Roman pottery here. So this is presumably abandoned uh, mm -hmm. at the time of the invasion. So very interesting stuff. And I think having that neighbouring sites excavated mm. is really interesting in trying to understand how these sites cooperated or not, or uh, not. how how they, they work together in terms of the, the chronology. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Having that sort of wider understanding of these sites can help you sort of piece together each one individually. I will say we do, we actually have a bit of a special guest in the chat. We do have Joe who found the spindle well and the cruise. Hey, Joe, good to see you. I'm here. <laughs> so, fantastic. We that is Joe's it. hand holding it up. It's a beautiful find. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Joe. You did incredible. She says hi all, so that's great. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, our next topic, we're going to sort of move on to the misunderstandings about prom uh, promontory forts. So we sort of covered what we already know, but is there anything out there that you think is uh, sort of misunderstood? It's interesting. I think one of the first things to tackle with prehistoric settlement is this idea that they're full of barbarians. Uh, they're Un, uh, un sort of modern places, they're dirty, they're smelly, uh, badly built buildings, and, and locals just basically pottering around in their own fields, uh, not really traveling, not really seeing the world. Uh, and that's a big misunderstanding when we come to the prehistoric coastal promontory forts of the Atlantic coast, really. Uh, we have, although, you know, if you go to Pembrokeshire today, it feels like you're a long way from anywhere, but actually we have Greek navigators and, and classical sailors visiting these uh, coasts from about 350 BC. Uh, we have uh, uh, Greeks visiting Cornwall to trade and buy tin. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a famous mariner called Pythias traveling out from the south of France 
navigating the coast of Wales and going up the Irish Sea, talking about the copper resources and the gold resources as well. And I've got this quote from, from Strabo, a Greek geographer in 7 BC, probably quoting Pythias from 300 years previously, about what Britannia, the islands offer, the cattle, the gold, the silver, uh, the slaves, dogs as well. There are many reasons to come to Britain. Hundreds of years before the Romans actually landed on shores in Kent and invaded uh, us as well. So very interesting how much was on offer from the Britannia Islands uh, as way back in prehistory. So a lot of people come to Pembrokeshire today, I guess, on holiday to seek a bit of peace and quiet. Lovely rural uh, landscape. They walk the coast path, they look out on the sea, and there's not a lot going on out there. But even 100 years ago, these rural West Wales coasts would have been really busy with coastal lighters, taking limestone and coal up and down the coast to ports of Cardiff. And 2000 years ago, this was an international seaway. So I've drawn up this map, which sort of spins Wales on its head, gets us away from thinking that the center of Britain is London and the Southeast. What we're seeing here is the sort of busy seaways of the Atlantic shore. So we're looking out, uh, you see the Dometi there, that's Pembrokeshire, the tribe occupying Pembrokeshire, Cornwall, the Balearion Peninsula, named by the Greeks. Uh, and these people living out on the western coast of Pembrokeshire and Cornwall would have been greeting mariners and traders from far shores. And we have some very, very rare finds to demonstrate this was actually happening. In the 1970s, sport divers off the coast of the Clean Peninsula in North Wales near Bardsey, of Porth Velin, pulled up a lead anchor stock. And this is a classical a ship that's founded here on the Welsh, Welsh coast about 100 BC. Uh, this is in the National Museum now. Uh, so a ship, it may have lost its anchor, it may be a shipwreck. And you can see on the cast on the side of the anchor here, four lucky knuckle bones. It's a lucky throw of knuckle bones. So this is a lucky throw to bring the ship good luck and uh, to make sure it doesn't founder. And um, So this is a classical ship from foreign shores visiting 100 years before the Roman conquest. And some of the names we have for Welsh features, Mona was named by the Greeks many years ago, Valerion and other names, and the Octopiti, a name that survived from Greek navigators for the Pembrokeshire Peninsula, is the coast of the eight dangers. So maritime hazards uh, that would have been uh, made known to people sailing these shores. I think as well, um, it's about modern perceptions of, of how we well, perhaps how we live today and how we can't imagine how anyone in the past um, might have lived is something to to think about as well. And whenever sort of some of the, the guided walks we've done or even perhaps the, the you guys when you were digging at Carvai visitors to sites, I would say the two questions we always have is how could somebody live here? There's no water. And also the next question is, you know, it's too dangerous to live at the coast edge. What if you, you you fall over? We see the signs every time where we're walking along the coast these days about danger of falling, falling off of the, the rocks. And I think we have to just just sort of take a step back and think about that. You know, we only had running water into our houses in the last couple of hundred years. It's not unheard of that it's very easy to go and gather water from nearby springs, from nearby sources. It's also very easy to gather water within your promontory for in collecting water there. So there might not necessarily be a source of water directly within that promontory fort, but there is water nearby. So it's perfectly, people are perfectly able to live. And we think about sieges, it wasn't, you know, society didn't work in the in in the same way then. It's not like siege warfare where you you sort of got to hold all, all of your, your resources. Um, and also the idea of, of concerns of safety. I mean, it, we, we do stand on so many of these sites and look down. And actually, what I find very interesting, it might be that the archaeological evidence isn't there because perhaps it's gone from erosion. We don't know or we haven't found it in the record is that there's not many safety barriers there on, on sites. You think of that big cauldron and you think if that was part of that monument at that time, were people falling into that? Did Were people you know how did how did people live there and operate there and we we don't we don't know but all i will say is i i think these are people who knew the seaways they knew where they were living um and you know you would see people probably scampering up and down a lot of a lot of the more accessible edges to the to these promontory forts as if it wasn't you know you don't worry about your health and safety or your or your rope work there so i think well, we, well, children we grow up in, yeah i mean st kilda in scotland in the, in the 19th century children growing up there would learn to climb the rocks 
for that rope since eight, nine years old, wouldn't they? And they start climbing the walls of the cottage as well. Mm -hmm. So get a lot of familiarity. Yeah, and, and I think it's also that actually living on the coast and having that inland and coastal economy is you've got the best of best of both worlds in terms of resources and what you can gather and live there. And it's a, a, a wonderful sort of um, quote from um, Andrew Fleming, who wrote about St Kilda, about how, you know, the mixed economy there and the view that you're looking at there is that we, we've, we've broken out of Pembrokeshire there and we've headed up the coast into to Gwyneth and Dinas Dinclay because it sets this, this, this coastal, this is more of a perhaps a trading point, but a hill fort directly on the coast and you you can sit in in that in that setting you've got the coastal resources you've got the fishing you've got all of those coastal resources but surrounding it and Pembrokeshire is the same it's got some of the richest agricultural land in Wales there so you've got all of the resources available to you surrounding your site in these rich wetlands and also areas for for agriculture so it's not a bad place to live with the resources that, that are around you. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, you, you, as well as the cheese and eggs and the potatoes here, you've got the young barrel of fulmers and a barrel of young gannets, you know, to see you through the winter. That's that's what the coast gives you, isn't it? It's absolutely brilliant. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, not to mention as well, it's a very beautiful place to live. <laughs> they definitely <laughs> take the nicest views. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about sort of that interconnectivity between these different ancient societies, but David had a question about sort of the connections between uh, these forts themselves. He was wondering if there's any evidence of roads between the forts? No, we're pre-road here. That we, we do have ridgeways and well-used trackways, um, you know, in parts of uh, lowland England where we have crop marks from the Iron Age. You can actually see roadways and droveways between mm. fields. Um, we've actually got some good later prehistoric field systems in Western Wales on Scombe Island as well. So not roads as such, but uh, well-used trackways and pathways. Uh, um, and they had wheeled vehicles as well. Yeah. And also I think about, you know, well, you're yeah. travelling, what would you, you probably would be getting on the water as well. Yeah. You think about links between, you know, you, these are seafaring um, communities and people that lived here and, and were in their sort of very much, you know, we're not talking about big boats or ships. We're talking about easy to manoeuvre, easy to manage sort of coracle style kind of um, shipping there that you can drag up onto land, you can walk around with, walk a bit, get in the sea a bit. So so it's, it is a very good question. It's really hard to to understand the, how the, the connectivity between the two, but perhaps you can also see them as, as those sort of beacons of warnings. These were, we look out to the sea today and often you won't, you know, you see the odd sailing ship out at sea or the odd boat, but you just wonder how much busier, you know, a thousand years ago so those seaways would be and how, you know, people kept in touch with each other to let people know what was going on around around sites, around faults, where where which faults were welcoming to people, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a really interesting thing to think about the communication and, and how that happened. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point, actually. I mean, we're going to touch upon that now, just as some of these unanswered questions, particularly about, you know, ports of trade around the coast. Again, you know, advancing ideas of, of you know, how how advanced these prehistoric societies were, uh, really. Um, they, you know, we know people were trading across the sea in the late Iron Age, before the Romans came here. Um, and but we don't really know where the ports of trade were. We've got excavations at Portharao and Carvai, but these are seem to be family settlements and they're doing metalworking of various things. But there are some really big coastal forts around the Pembrokeshire coast, particularly Deer Park, you see up on the left there, just opposite Scomber Island. This is massive. Uh, and what we see at Deer Park is an enormous headland enclosed here, but the ramparts actually run down to the sea they actually have run down to the embarkation point, which is very interesting. And what we're looking for around the Welsh coast, really, and it's a new avenue of research, probably, is where the trading ports were. I've got a quote here from Barry Cunliffe. You may have read it as we we're talking. You know, if you're going to trade in prehistory, you don't just set out from your, your uh, port one day and sail across to Wales, hoping to buy some cattle or hoping to buy some uh, brooches and swords because you don't know where to go and you don't know if somebody's going to be waiting for you on the other side on the cliff top of that particular day. You need to have fixed places for trade, often very recognisable from the sea, maybe a big sea mark or particular outcrop on the coast as well. And you need to know that when you arrive, there'll be somebody there you can trade with at a pre-arranged time. And you can take, you can barter, you can trade without any political interference as well. And this is what a port of trade is. 
And we know there was a big one down in Cornwall called Ictis, uh, where tin was traded, maybe St. Michael's Mount that the Greeks talk about. Um, but we have other candidates in Pembrokeshire. We have uh, Fish Ponds Camp in Stackpole, that Lou and I looked at some years ago, uh, which is actually sticks out on this inland estuary, uh, giving access to the sea. And like Deer Park, it's got these very straight, uh, sort of regular ramparts across the promontory, very unlike any other Pembrokeshire promontory fort. And there's this difference in design and architecture indicating it's a special place. Another big uh, promontory fort, which was probably a port of trade, is Dramana at Dublin on the Irish coast. And that's got these very similar ramparts to Deer Park, you see, cutting off this huge promontory uh, for trading at sea. So we need to do more work to research these. I mean, one of the questions is, you know, where are the exotic finds? You know, we've got uh, spindle whorls and pottery and things from Kaivai, but no really exotic traded goods. But perhaps they're quite rare to find. We have to rely on a bit of luck and chance. Uh, this is a worm's head promontory down in South Wales and the Gower Peninsula. Absolutely stunning. Uh, and this is a, a, a mould for jewellery that was found by chance in an erosion feature here uh, just before the 1920s. And it was published and people didn't really take much notice of it. And then somebody wrote about it in 1974. And now it's gone back in a box at the National Museum again. Uh, but this is a continental brooch, brooch design found on the South Wales coast. And uh, the guy in the 70s thought that itinerant traders may have travelled here and set up camp. So there are exotic finds out there, but they're very rare. Mm. Uh, and we need to do more work to research those. We have some of the, the finds that have come up in the sort of earlier excavations. There's amber. So there's mm. evidence of amber. So obviously that's a, a traded good that's come. Jet. Jet yeah, as well. Just so the northeast of England, Jet. Yeah. Lovely sort of glass beads. So there are sort of the day to day finds and that, but actually putting that in the context of the, the real evidence of, of, mm. of the ports and trade is. is more excavations, is more projects. That's what we need, Jenny. Yeah. 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 But um, I think it's time to touch that subject of, you know, we've spoken very much saying, well, the promontory faults, all of the evidence we have and all of the ones we looked this at. This is the exciting stuff. Has, right, evidence yeah. of people were living here this is where they lived you can see their huts you can see the material culture but um toby and i have, have pretty much i well i, I wouldn't say it visited all 60 promontory yeah. in pembrokeshire but it's you know we're trying to tick them off and you do come across some really oddities we're still calling them perhaps we can't call them a fault but we're still calling them in many ways these are still promontories bits of land jutting out to the sea that have been um enclosed in some way and there's some real oddities out there, and we're just showing you one here, which is the the, the Moanwood Promontory Enclosure on, on Stackpole. It's this tiny, tiny, narrow finger of rock sticking out. It's about a couple of metres meters wide at its breadth, and you've got these sort of like straight sides around it. It's obviously been a bit of erosion, but also you've got a defined cut ditch that blocks off that promontory as a young Toby there is, 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 is stood against. Stood against. And... Um, we don't know you know it, it's baffling it's like there's something odd going on here it's a, a promontory that has been enclosed but for what for what purpose has has that been enclosed and uh answers on a postcard really i think it's uh you know it's a good place to go and commune with the gods right at the end of that tip um and you know this is a subject that we've not really done a lot of work on in wales other people have done more work elsewhere um but, you know, you go out to these coastal promontory forts uh, on a, in a storm, and they're quite interesting places. You're at that interface of land and sea. And what we do see from the Welsh Iron Age, particularly uh, on mainland Wales, we get a repeated deposition of prestige metalwork, swords, shields, cauldrons in, in watery places, bogs and lakes, but also dangerous places, mountain ridges, dark caves and chasms. Uh, and... You know, this indicates that coastal promontory forts were probably very likely to be places where there was an element of ceremony and ritual going on at the coast edge. We talked about the cauldron uh, earlier on, we had a question about it, and we can see this great blowhole uh, in uh, Flimston Bay uh, up at the top left here. Uh, and we think this is quite a, an interesting feature of the promontory fort. It's a massive hole, no doubt, uh, there during the Iron Age. And uh, we get uh, incredible sounds during storms come up here, waves crashing, wind howling. It would have been a, an unusual, strange feature within the promontory fort. And it may have been a focus of ritual and ceremony in the Iron Age. And how do we know this? Well, we're lacking finds of some of the Welsh promontory forts, 
But Trarendinus in Cornwall is a very interesting coastal promontory fort. Um, uh, a lot of work's been done here. The promontory cuts off this huge natural outcrop. And there was a rocking stone, the Logan stone here, which was a focus for folklore and everything in past centuries. And actually work here has shown that there's Bronze Age burials and Iron Age pottery below this great rocking stone. So prehistoric communities were revering the unusual outcrops here. And we have interesting finds just back in 2015 from a cave on the Gower Peninsula, a coastal cave. This tiny lunar figurine was discovered, very similar to one up uh, the Seven Estuary as well. So we have people depositing special finds, ritual finds in these dark coastal caves. And this is another one, Dinas Mauer in Pembrokeshire, an unusual promontory with a rock tower in it. So we have practical defenses, but no houses. There's just a rock tower being enclosed by these defenses. So while we have plenty of evidence, people living at the coast edge, farming and working and metalworking, there are a handful of very, very odd places mm -hmm. on the coast, which I think were probably principally used for sacred purposes and ceremony. I, th I think the, the the idea of, you know, the cauldron, We I, I don't know, perhaps there is a way of trying to identify if the cauldron predates or postdates the, the Flimston. We do, you know, I don't think, think there is, but in a number of other sites, you do see these slight blowhole features and some have been exasperated by more recent collapse um, and, and, and erosion. But you do wonder in the architecture of some of these sites, they do seem to like to enclose the drops, the, the you know, it's almost part of the drama. And I think even you think about your senses and the sound, you imagine the waves crashing through that blowhole and the noise and everything. I think, you know, I think there's something really important mm. about that as a, as, as a place as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the, those kind of features are monumental even today. So you can only imagine that, you know, back then, they would feel the exact same way as we do now. Um, but before we sort of move on to climate change, we have had quite a few different questions about sea levels and climate, which is fantastic. So we can definitely try and answer some of those now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I've made note of some other questions as well. So I think just before we move on, any questions I miss now, I will come back to at the end. But I think Joanna asked a really good question um, about trade that we were just talking about. She asked um, how they communicated for trade. So would they have sent out maybe scouts or messengers to broker deals? How would they have sort of established those trade connections? Very interesting. Uh, there's an awful lot of literature on, on how you navigate and, and move across the sea. Uh, Facing the Ocean by Barry Canliffe in 2001 is a really good book to get secondhand if you want to have a look at this in detail. Um, but people traveled a lot on the sea. So people familiarize themselves with the coast. And this navigator Pythias in uh, 340 BC left Marseille and circumnavigated Britain over about two years. And it's clear he landed at uh, market sites in Cornwall, talked with the locals, chatted to them, recorded their language, recorded their customs, moved on, went to the Isle of Man, took sightings of uh, latitude and met the locals again. Uh, so people are familiar with coastal communities. People are welcoming in boats that are at sea uh, and so on. So there is that communication. But we also know when the Romans invaded Britain, you know, scouts were, were a big thing. The Romans used pre-existing Iron Age routes to invade the landscape. So you negotiate with local people, you ask them questions, you pay them some money or, or some goods, and they'll give you information about where to go next, where the rocks are to avoid, which reefs you need to sail around. So there's a you know, huge amount of communication that we just don't do nowadays in the countryside. And I wonder about how, you know, society was organised that, you know, there's, you know, different jobs for different people. And I think trading and that was one prominent role that, yeah. that, that certain people had their role was to, to work across and, and, and trade. And I suppose it's like any any salesperson now, you know, you build up your networks and you know, you know where to target and you know what times of year if you're you're looking for certain goods. And you know where the, the 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 best minerals or the best you know wealth is, but you also know what 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 people want as well. So you you've got that kind of economy, haven't you? So yeah, fascinating. Yeah, and I think one more question, which actually ties really nicely into those ideas of trade and transport, um, from Joanna again. Um, are there any signs of possible harbors associated with the forts, either below or beside them? That's a really, really good question. And it's, I, I don't know if you say harbour, but there's certainly landing places. So nearly every, pretty much every promontory fault, more or less, has a close or relatively nearby landing place. And because they're jutting out, 
you've got landing places which will work in different weather patterns and weather conditions that offer different shelter we wonder if we've got one off the the top of carvi there if that if if if, if that was a, a natural harbor um when i read some of the early documents there's often um note that of of pathways that that come up the the the, the sort of cliff faces as it were so pathways up and we've lost a lot of those with erosion now so some of that evidence is 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 really missing but i'm not saying all but you know bearing in mind the kind of ships the kind of routes that people were trading you know they was they were close enough to have many natural easy very easy pulling places to to, to stop off of and then access the the, the fort from there Mm, yeah, Kim says that she agrees with you there about Carvai, about it just missing that pathway up from the harbour because of erosion. Um, but we're, we're going to jump now just back into the future for a little bit, and we're going to talk a bit about climate change and the threats that that poses to the archaeology. So anyone who did ask questions, don't worry, I've not forgotten you, I'll come back to you very we soon. We will be able to answer them, yeah. Yeah, yeah but for now, yeah, would you like to sort of take us through what sort of threats we're facing in yeah. the modern day? So this was the the big thing about the the Cherish project, really. And um, if anything, you know, I would say that because of its monument type, a coastal promontory fort is one of the most threatened monument types that we have. We we have a hundred or so around the coast of Wales, and give or take, I would say, over 50, 60, 70 percent of those are seriously at risk of being lost over the next couple of centuries possibly and when you think about that in context this is a really rare monument type and we're just losing all of the archaeology and knowledge and it's irreplaceable which is why we need to be doing this kind of work now but in terms of the threats it, it, it's it's we've got rise we've got increased temperatures now increased temperatures are melting the the ice sheets which is causing the the sea level rise so anything that is located on the coast or on the coastline is is subsequently at threat so by the end of the century this part of Wales we're probably looking at a 40 to 50 centimeter increase in sea level now that's not so much of an impact now but it's going to be more and more of an impact over the next decades over the next hundred of years and if you're on the coastline depending on your geology and the rock type that is going to be these wave washed Hill forts are going to become more wave washed and more eroded as a result of that. But we've also got the changing weather patterns that are associated with that. We're getting much um, warmer and wetter winters. And that rainfall is causing a real problem at a number of the sites because it's saturating the ground so much that it's actually pushing pushing the cliff face away really so we're getting the the loss of the the cliff face there and you can see on this slide a really good example of what we're left with now for archaeologists it's quite handy actually because we get a beautifully um preserved section of a, a bank and ditch at linny head there that we that we can record but it's, it's pushing away the archaeology there and if you're thinking also of of, of other impacts you know we're, we're we're getting much warmer much drier summers as well and a lot of these sites aren't heavily vegetated, but in some of them that are, um, it's going to, you know, change in species, bigger root penetration, disrupting the archaeology, but fires as well. I always said, oh, you you don't suffer with wildfires along the coastline, but just last year near to, to Carvai, a whole area of the coastline um, went up in flames there. It was so dry and it might have been a barbecue that had gone wrong but it's still causing that impact and the the impact that that has to the archaeology so there's so many different factors that are affecting these promontory forts that i think it really does make them in my mind one of the most at-risk monument types that that we have definitely i mean there are ways that we can uh we're in the cherish project we're surveying it just sort of you know, uh, look at these quickly. I mean, we've developed this amazing toolkit of approaches for surveying uh, the coast zone over the last six years in our European funded project. We won't go through them all now, um, but we'll be launching this at a conference next month for our sort of working methods. Uh, but, you know, the only way to tackle the coast zone is a complicated area. You know, you start in the satellite imagery, airborne laser scanning, aerial photography, which is what I do for a day job. We've been working with geographers to do peak coring, doing geophysics uh, and working with people like dig ventures to do excavations as well and even and this is Lou here dangling from a rope we've even done some cliff access stuff as well um, but it's all about making a more accurate record of where the coast is and where the archaeology is now before it all falls away really that's what the, our, our sort of cherished project's been about for the last six years 
And I just thought I'd wrap up just to have a look at, uh, you know, our, our sort of modern working methods now at a site, Flimston Bay Promontory. Again, we're revisiting Flimston Bay here. This is a heavily eroding limestone coastline here. If you haven't been down here, uh, it's a great place to go and visit. Uh, it's got some of the most spectacular coastal scenery in Wales. We've got the, the Green Bridge, which actually collapsed. Part of it collapsed in the 2017 Storm Ophelia. Natural arches here and this great promontory fort. You can see the pock marks of Iron Age houses here and the great cauldron there as well. Um, and, you know, the best way or one of the best ways to survey these really complicated eroding sites nowadays is, of course, with drones. If you haven't got airborne laser scanning, well, so we went down there in 2020, just after lockdown lifted, actually. And we spent a couple of days doing drone surveys along the coast here. Had our DJI Phantom drone, took 1800 images. Um, we mapped about, well, just over a kilometre of coastline to a few centimetres. I think it's got four or five centimetre accuracy uh, for this bit of coastline. But that gives us this amazing digital terrain model you can see here in the computer, which shows us where everything was in 2020. Whenever we have a collapse into the future, 50 or 100 years time, we've got this data archived. And these are the individual photographs the drone takes and the computer then pops up this photogrammetric model. And what that means is we can, we can look at how these sites are changing. You know, there's our drone model from 2020, every pebble on the beach almost. There's Lou's survey from 2009 uh, with a, an advanced uh, GPS kit, uh, GNSS it's called. We can overlay one with the other. There was a big collapse here in 2015. So we can do visual checks of how many uh, meters of cliff have fallen away. Uh, and that's one way to do it. Uh, there's about five meters lost here in the last five years. Uh, but what we're increasingly looking at nowadays is better science, better technology to, to really map how these sites are changing. And um, we just had this back last month. It's quite exciting. Uh, Dean Astinthley Coastal Fort in North Wales which is being eroded by the sea and also by intense uh, rainfall, groundwater's pushing the cliff off. But we've been able to have overlay a June 2018 drone survey on the bottom and a March 2021 drone survey over the top. Uh, some very clever people put those together and subtract one from the other. And those areas in red here are areas of greatest change and erosion. Some vegetation change here, don't worry about that. But this is these big red patches where the cliff's falling off. And areas of green, a greatest accretion where things are building up. So it's falling off a cliff and building up at the foot of the cliff here and stabilizing the cliff on the beach. So, you know, it's, it's doing this better science on some of these sites is, is really going to pay dividends. Mm. Better science, but I have to also say that it's great having the science that we can quantify how much has been lost, but actually what we should be doing is making sure we're we're doing the archaeology to, to recover what we can, and it is expensive and it is difficult, and we, we can do everything for every single site but I think it's that that having that kind of approach whether it be through the sort of community-led excavations to the, the the research and other excavations it's it's crucial that we start planning more to to deal with this into mm. the future it's been very much reactionary in the past but we now need to start really planning our work to to take take account of all of this going forward really. I mean it's just about the last slide from us but it's just uh, nice to show that there are outturns with all the new work we've done at Dynastantly. We're actually working now with uh, uh, Wessex, the clever artists down there to, to do new interpretation panels. And there'll be one coming for Kaivai as well. We haven't seen the artwork quite yet, uh, but this is the draft artwork for Dynastantly as it appeared in the Roman times. Uh, and that's it now. So half of it's chopped away. So, you know, it's got to be the end point. It's got to be getting more people to these sites getting more people understanding these sites and, and really, uh, really loving them as well. So, you know, uh, that's the sort of field work into the interpretation. That's really fantastic. And I think it's, it's incredibly important, the work that you're doing. So thank you for sort of taking on that responsibility and looking after these sites. Um, I believe you do have one more thing that you'd like to share with us before we go on. Yeah, the last thing to, from us is that we've got a big conference happening in, uh, in uh, Dublin in March. Um, and it's not going to be accessible for everybody, of course, but it is a free conference. So if, you, if you're able to get over to Dublin, uh, it's a free day conference and we'll be launching our how we've done our work, our good practice guide as well. Uh, but all that will be available online afterwards to watch if you want to see that. Um, so that's a little a little plug for our conference there, but Ginny, but that's, that's almost it from us. I think we've done quite a lot of talking, actually, so uh, there may be some questions to answer. 
Yep, absolutely. I've made a note of a few different questions, so we can go through some of them now. If anyone else has any more questions that they think of, do feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat as well. Um, but I will start with Jim. Jim asked a question a while back. He asked um, if there's any evidence that the use of the promontories was seasonal. Um, so perhaps use more during the summer and less in the winter. This is uh, a common debate uh, about whether you can live in these sites in the winter and whether it's pretty harsh and stormy. Uh, and a lot of antiquarian excavators in the 19th century said, no way, you know, we've been digging here in the winter, you don't want to live here. Um, but there's good evidence, there's more evidence that people were living here intensively full time, I, I would say, than they were partly abandoned. I see no reason why people wouldn't be living here full time. And if you have visited a reconstructed Iron Age roundhouse, they're not only cosy, they're warm, strong, stormproof buildings. So yeah. I would say year round settlement most of the time. I, I think so as well. I think we see the ruins and we assume that that. But if you look at the reconstructions with, you know, the roundhouses, you've got the much bigger banks, ditches that offer more shelter and, and that kind of thing. I I, I see them more as, as, as continually occupied across the year. Interesting. Yeah. So they're really investing in this and building those mm. the cosy homes to themselves. Um, speaking of sort of uh, things like temperature and exposure, uh, Cam actually asked about the climate and whether it's much different than it is today. I think the the prevailing understanding of the Roman period, early Roman period, was the climate was a little bit of a warmer period than it is uh, now. It's fluctuated, obviously. Uh, we have vine growing uh, and so on going on in the south of England in the Roman period. Uh, so uh, and there was a sort of there was a huge climatic de deterioration in the late Bronze Age. Uh, due to various factors and it warmed and recovered about 400 BC so you had an explosion of settlement and agriculture in about 400 BC in the Iron Age. I think the, the, the we don't have a huge amount but we do have um, some paleo evidence from from around the yeah. sites and the sort of evidence is showing that you know it, it was growing standard species that you would expect sort of, sort of some forms of wheat so you know Pembrokeshire coastal Pembrokeshire actually for those who have visited or dug there it has a surprise it's a good it does have a very good climate and it's that kind of area that, that is a, mm. a, a better climate there. So I think in terms of agriculture and, and growing, it, it, it was very favourable. And whilst the temperature might have been slightly different, we're probably talking by a few degrees rather than anything dramatically different. And also by that point, you know, sea level isn't far off what, what we're seeing today. You know, you've got the obviously the end of the last glaciation 12,000 years ago, sea levels are rising and, and it's rising into the sort of Neolithic and you're starting to see the dramatic change sort of around the Neolithic period and sort of, but then it settles settles down more towards the sort of um, Bronze Age and Iron Age then. So we're not too far off where where these were wave washed sites basically as they they are today fascinating yeah, a few people had asked uh, about sea levels so that's really good i hope that's answered their questions as well um it looks like we have two more questions which is good for timing as well but if anyone does have any more please do ask um both are regarding further research people have been really inspired by what you guys have been talking about today um graham was wondering if you could please reference the book on navigation again that you uh, mentioned earlier uh, well, uh, there's a book, if you've got a pen handy, it's uh, Facing the Ocean by Barry Cunliffe. I think it's 2001 or 2005. And I, I would also recommend for a good read is The Extraordinary Voyage of Pythias the Greek, which is also Barry Cunliffe. Um, uh, so just, just search for Pythias, P-Y-T-H-E-A-S. Uh, I got mine second hand a few uh, a few months ago. So some good books out there. And if you if you wanted to relive some antiquarian tours, then um Fenton's 1811 tour of Pembrokeshire is a is a, it's a really you can nice get online, yeah, kind of you can get yeah. that online. It's a really nice read to sort of of the archaeology of that time of the area. And he does mention a number of the promontory forts there. And uh, mm. and it's good to unpick against a map to try and decide where you think he's talking about. So it's it's all fun. Fantastic. I've made notes of those because we will send out further resources in the follow up email. So I'll make sure that they're included, too, um, for anyone who would like to read them um, and hasn't had a chance to write them down yet. Um, and our other question was from Joanna again. She asked um, if there's somewhere that we can access a list of all the sites that you have mentioned in this talk um, to do a bit further research. Um, we can. I think the best thing I could suggest that you do is is go onto the a resource called Cob 
Kovlein, so C-O-F-L-E-I-N, and that's the database that we hold here at the Royal Commission. So it's an online public database with a map interface and there's dots on all of the maps and you can just work your way along the coast and, and click on the dot about Flimston Promontory Fort or you could um, search it online and it should it will bring you up a good site description lots of um, Toby's wonderful aerial imagery of the site surveys that we've got so that's a really good online resource for sort of finding out more about places and also Arquilio which is the um, David, the, the archaeological trust's online resource as well. Fantastic. I'll note those down too, so I can pop them in the email as well. Um, and we'll finish off with one last question. Let me just find it again. So this is from Claire. Um, Claire says that you briefly referenced the absence of water sources on some of these forts. Do you know how the inhabitants manage? I think it's a bit of, as a chap, Willoughby Gardner, an archaeologist in 1926, wrote a big paper about hill forts in North Wales. And he addressed the, the, the lack of water there by saying, basically, you're going to have to walk for it. Uh, if there's no water on the hill fort, um, but he was saying, you know, people in Africa and Asia at the, the time he was writing, children and, and everybody would, would walk several miles to get water each day and bring it back to the settlement. Um, so I think uh, not having a, a big pond inside the fort, uh, especially the limestone areas, is difficult. I think sometimes, it, you know, you would go without your morning tea. You wouldn't need to drink all the time. And if you needed water for jobs, you'd go off and get it and send the children off to get it. Uh, it's a bit harder than the life we have nowadays. I and think, I, I think you, there wasn't so much need for water for every, you know, you weren't running washing machines. You were no. running, sorry, it's stating the obvious, I know. But, you know, the, the quantity of water you needed for everyday life was probably slightly different. And if you think about well-constructed roundhouses with eaves coming down, water collection points as well that can be used, there's there's ways of gathering and, and, yeah. and using using water in that way as well. Just because we haven't seen the evidence in the archaeology on the ground as it survived doesn't mean that it wasn't there in terms of wooden barrels or, or different things. And plenty of uh, beer and wine, as somebody's just commented uh, from abroad. Absolutely. Me, <laughs> cider, yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much. So we're just at seven o'clock now and I think we've run out of questions. So I just want to say a massive thank you to Toby and Louise for joining us tonight, for sharing your knowledge. Um, it's been really, really interesting. I've learned a lot. I'm fairly sure everyone in the audience has learned some stuff as well. Um, so it's been really great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us in the audience who's been sharing your thoughts and your questions and your comments as well. It's been really great to see so many of you engaging with it. Um, just before I say goodbye, I'll just share a few things from Dig Ventures quickly. Um, get my PowerPoint up again. Here we go. So if you would like to come and dig with us and join us at Carvai this summer, um, you are absolutely more than welcome to. We are currently crowdfunding this dig at the moment, so you can head to our website and sign up for yourself. Join us either online or in person and help us carry out that research that we've talked about tonight is so, so important um, with these threats of climate change. Um, so just head to digventures.com forward slash calendar to have a look at that and see what you can sign up for. In addition to that, you can check out our website for other fun resources and things as well. I'll be attaching uh, some of our reports and things in that email too, um, and some of our updates from Carvai last year, so you can sort of read into that if you've been really uh, interested in what you've learned tonight. You can also follow us on social media, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we're on Twitter, so you can have a look and find out what we're doing day to day. And like I said, you can join us on a dig in 2023, whether that's Carvai or if there's another site that tickles your fancy, um, you can find them all on our calendar there. Um, so with that, that's everything from me. And I would just like to say one more thank you again to our speakers and everyone in our audience. I'll uh, spotlight these guys so you can see them all waving goodbye as well. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jenny. That's brilliant. Thank you. Very well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And good night.